G'day everybody and welcome to Laws 11061 Contracts A, Topic 11. My name's Anthony Maranak and this week we're talking about the Australian Consumer Law. <clears throat> now we've come across the Australian Consumer Law of, uh, before, of course, during this term. In fact, I think we might have started talking about it way back in week one and we've talked about it a couple of times on the way through since then. So let's revise a little of that. The Australian Consumer Law is a very new beast. Um, it was only commenced in 2010, although it was uh, under preparation for a couple of years before that. So you're still among the first um, groups of students to actually deal with the consumer law whilst doing contracts A. The reason for the consumer law is that prior to 2010, most commercial activity was regulated by uh, both the states who all had their sale of goods type legislation. In fact, some states had up to three or four pieces of legislation covering sale of goods. And also by the Commonwealth, which had the Trade Practices Act, which regulated, um, among other things, some forms of consumer rights in relation to trade. And it also regulated a whole bunch of aspects of trade based on the Commonwealth's corporation's power under the Constitution which I guess will probably not mean terribly much to those of you who haven't done constitutional law yet, uh, but take it from me, the Commonwealth was able to regulate the activity of corporations. Thing is, of course, this created a real problem for businesses in Australia because, I mean, we're all getting used to the idea now that we basically have a global economy, that we have companies in Australia who are selling products overseas and, you know, most of the time when I want to buy a book, I buy it from an online place in the United Kingdom. I download software from the UK. Um, I buy gym equipment from Hong Kong. Y your physical location in the world is starting to matter very little. And so you can see that for uh, companies operating in Australia, it was a real problem to have different um, regulatory regimes in different states and territories. If you were a company and you had retail outlets in South Australia, um, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, you could be t potentially be dealing with four different types of rules in relation to the sale of goods and services. And on top of those, if you have a corporate structure, you're probably dealing with the Trade Practices Act as well. Now, can anyone say messy? You know, this was creating real problems for Australian companies or for companies operating in Australia because, of course, all of these different regulatory regimes brought along costs. They couldn't just set up one business model and operate it across all of the states and territories. Eventually, I guess it's only been, what, 110 years since Federation, but eventually the, the Australian governments all got together and said, this is something we can fix. And so they came up with a harmonised Australian consumer law. So what we actually have is that the, uh, the Commonwealth has passed the basic piece of legislation, which is called the Competition and Consumer Act 2010. Now within that Act, you've got Schedule 2. And Schedule 2 of that Act is the Australian Consumer Law. What happens then is that every state and territory has implemented its own legislation um, which basically says the Australian Consumer Law, which is in Schedule 2 of the Competition and Consumer Act 2010, now applies in Queensland. So you can see that we have harmonised legislation around Australia, uh, but it's not relying on the Commonwealth's power. The Commonwealth's not somehow overriding the powers of the states. What's actually happening is that um, there's one central piece of legislation and the states have essentially volunteered to pick that piece of legislation up. So that's the general background to why we have the Australian Consumer Law. During today's lecture, we're not going to go into massive amounts of detail about all aspects of the ACL. Some of that stuff you will do when you study property law. Some of that stuff you will do when you study corporations law. What we're really only going to look at is those parts of the Australian consumer law which specifically affect contracts and primarily the pieces which specifically affect consumer contracts. So what we're looking at this week is uh, first we're going to look at how to identify a consumer contract and uh, separate a consumer contract from any other type of contract. We're going to talk about what we mean by a standard form contract. 
the Australian Consumer Law provides a bunch of specific rules for standard form contracts and we'll look at why that's important and what those rules are. We then go on and look at the rules in the ACL which are intended to prevent unfair terms in those standard form contracts. And finally, we'll look at consumer guarantees contained within the Australian Consumer Law. Now you'll remember last week when we talked about implied terms in contracts, we said there were two types of implied terms. There's terms which are implied into the uh, contract in order to give effect to the intentions of the parties, so basically gap filler where the parties have missed important stuff out. And then we said there were implied terms which were implied by law, which the law says must be in there. And they were things like the uh, implied duty to cooperate and the implied duty of good faith. And I said that there were also a bunch of statutory duties which were implied in by legislation. And I promised that this week we would talk about some of those. And that's where they come up. These are the consumer guarantees contained within the Australian Consumer Law. So, any questions? Nope, can't hear any. Great, let's jump in. What's a consumer contract? First thing we look at is for, as our threshold for a consumer contract is the price. Now, a consumer contract is usually less than $40,000. I hate using, using terms like usually. I would much rather be able to give you um, one simple rule that you could just lay down and apply in all circumstances. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work like that. Most of the time, a consumer contract is going to be less than $40,000, but just every now and then, you might get a consumer making a purchase which is worth more than $40,000, but which is the sort of thing that a normal consumer would normally purchase. So an example might be an expensive piece of jewellery, an example might be a motor vehicle. Motor vehicles these days are quite commonly above $40,000. Um, an example might be a, a, a case of particularly expensive wine. Um, there are apparently stamps out there that cost more than $40,000. So you can see a little bit of imagination and you can see that it's not entirely unreasonable to think that there are going to be um, consumer contracts for purchases worth more than $40,000. Um, I would imagine that if you were getting a package deal on expensive furniture for a house, uh, you, you, would, you could quite possibly pay $40,000. Um, if you're buying a piece of artwork, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure that if we all put our heads together, we could come up with a list of 20 or 30 different types of transaction where you could potentially be paying more than $40,000. But the, the, uh, the price threshold is a good start. Once we've considered the price threshold, we then have to look at what the goods are going to be used for. If the goods are being purchased for resale, then we don't have a consumer contract. Now that's regardless of price. So you might purchase goods worth 5 or $6.00. But you purchase them with the intention of selling them on your eBay store, which you have set up and which has its own Australian business number and so on and so on. Well, all of a sudden, we're not talking about a consumer contract. If you're purchasing something in order to resell it, it's not a consumer contract. Having said that, we can make this even more complicated. Most of you would have bought a textbook at the start of this semester, hopefully for this subject, but if not this for this subject, then for other subjects. Most of you are probably contemplating that once you've managed to get contracts out of the way, hooray, and you never have to think about contracts ever again, you'll probably try to sell the textbook. Now, what does that mean? Have you purchased the textbook for resale because you are contemplating reselling it? Or have you purchased the textbook for your own use as a student? Well, obviously, this is something that would have to be determined on the facts if it ever came to a trial, but I'd be pretty confident in that situation of saying that it really wasn't purchased for resale. It was purchased for your use, but it was also purchased with the knowledge that it would quite possibly retain its value and that you could sell it on later. Same, same if you purchase a motor vehicle. These days, most people would not purchase a motor vehicle with the intention of running the thing completely into the ground. You're aware that one day you might want to trade the motor vehicle in on a new motor vehicle, but that doesn't mean that you're buying it for resale. To be buying something for resale, you have to be buying it with the primary intention of reselling it, usually for a profit. 
The second thing is that it's not for use in trade or commerce. And what we're talking about there is what we call transformation or manufacture. So if you're going to take, if you're going to go down to Bunnings and you're going to buy a heap of timber, and your intention when you buy that heap of timber is to use your, uh, your skills at carpentry to turn that timber into furniture and resell it, then we're not talking about a consumer contract. On the other hand, if I go down to Bunnings and buy that same wood in order to use my very modest skills at carpentry to make something to try and impress my wife and use around the home, that is a consumer contract. Okay, because the first in the first example, the wood is being purchased for transformation in the course of trade or commerce. In the second case, it's being uh, purchased for personal, domestic or household consumption. Now look, all of this is really just a way of formalizing stuff that you all pretty much understand anyway. Most of the time when you're analyzing these sorts of contracts to try and work out whether they're consumer contracts or not, you're pretty safe to just trust your instincts. Is something being done in order to uh, uh, pursue business or is something being done in order to uh, satisfy personal, domestic or household consumption needs. Occasionally there'll be grey areas in between the two, particularly where you get people who are working or operating businesses from home. But generally speaking, it's not that difficult to work out whether a contract is a consumer contract or not. Now, why does this matter? If it's not a consumer contract, then you can click stop on the rest of this lecture. None of the rules that I'm about to talk about for the rest of this lecture matter in business or other non-consumer contracts. These rules are intended to protect consumers only. So, if some sneaky bloke called Maranac puts a question in the examination that seems to talk about the Australian consumer law, but you realise that the contract is actually not a domestic or consumer contract at all, don't go applying the Australian consumer law. Okay, if you do, then you will get a terribly bad mark and I will draw a sad little face on your exam paper. The rules that we're talking about today are just for consumer contracts. So you've got to start by getting past that threshold. What we do have to do then is divide our consumer contracts into standard form contracts and non-standard form contracts. What we've got there on the uh, on the slide is a picture of boilerplate. You've got no idea how hard it was to try and find a picture to illustrate the idea of a standard form contract. But boilerplate is what they refer to as um, as f the fine print, which is just repeated and repeated and repeated. So what's a standard form contract and how does it fit in with boilerplate? Well, a standard form contract is usually a pre-prepared contract which is just provided to the seller. Um, I know that for a long time Harvey Normans used to do this all the time and I'm not picking on them in any way, it's just a great example that you would show up to the, uh, to the checkout at a Harvey Norman and instead of just getting a little normal receipt like you would get from uh, any other um, retailer, they would, they would print off a great big invoice with all sorts of terms and conditions attached to the back and basically what they were printing was a standard form contract. Now, standard form contracts have got a bit of a bad rap over the years because people so, almost sort of see them as a, a shonky way to do business. They're actually not. Standard form contracts are great because they reduce the transaction costs. Can you imagine how expensive it would be if everyone who wanted to buy a TV at Harvey Norman's had to sit down with one of their managers and negotiate a contract from the ground up? It would add, it would probably double the cost of everything that you were trying to buy. It makes much more sense when you have repeated almost identical transactions to have a repeated almost identical contract. So we can start out with the idea that standard form contracts are actually very useful in normal trade and commerce, but they do come with a risk. And the risk is that it's usually the retailer who prepares the standard form contract and truth be told, it's usually only the retailer who ever actually knows what's in it. There's not too many people are going to sit down and read the contract 
from start to finish to make sure they fully understand what they're signing up to. And we know from Lestrange and Graucob a few weeks ago that if you sign it, then you wear it, regardless of whether you actually read it or not. In fact, a couple of years ago, when I was uh, making preparations for my wedding, I had a look at the contract, the standard form contract that I'd been sent by the videographer. And it contained some very odd provisions, which I wasn't happy to sign up to. And so I emailed them back and said, hey, can you explain why these provisions are in there? And uh, the, the store manager contact or the practice manager contacted me back and she said well actually I've never read this contract before so I really can't explain why those provisions are in there. So you can see the standard form contracts whilst they, they, they do have a lot going for them in terms of helping to reduce transaction costs they come with this risk that either the buyer or in some cases the buyer and the seller may be signing up to something that they really haven't thought through. Now if we go one step dodgier Retailers are not stupid. They know that virtually nobody is ever going to read these contracts and they know that virtually nobody is ever going to read the contracts before signing and walking away with their product. You want to walk away. You want to get your product home and unwrap it and uh, plug it in and uh, see what's going on with it. You're, exci you're not excited about the contract. You're excited about the product. So most people are just going to sign it and go home. Under those circumstances, there's a real temptation for the retailer to present the customer with a one-sided contract, including a whole bunch of unfair terms. And those unfair terms might be, for instance, restrictions on the uh, entitlement of the customer to returns or refunds, or they might be a um, exclusion of liability in relation to any consequent harm caused by the product, even if it's used properly. So when they put together the Australian Consumer Law, and in fact, when you look at the Trade Practices Act and some of the sale of good legislation which preceded the Australian Consumer Law, the government said, this is somewhere we can help. And so what they've done is implemented rules to prevent unfair contractual terms in standard form contracts. We're going to talk about the rules in a minute, but let's go back over that last sentence has to be an unfair contractual term. In a few moments we'll talk about what the rules are for that. But then it has to be in a standard form contract. So if this is a contract that two people, the two parties have actually sat down and negotiated, none of these provisions apply. Two parties are completely entitled to negotiate an unfair contract if that's what they want to do. Okay, so these rules, these unfair contractual term rules, only apply to standard form contracts and then we add on to that they only apply to standard form contracts if those are consumer contracts so if you've got a contract between two businesses now nah, that can be as unfair as they want or if you've got a contract that has actually been negotiated for then that can have unfair terms as well okay these provisions are only designed to protect consumer contracts which are also standard form contracts. So what do we mean by an unfair contractual term? Well there's a few indicators. Unfair in this context actually takes its normal English meaning. So in essence it becomes a question of fact. If you can bring evidence which can convince the judge in your case that the contractual term is unfair then there's no need for a more technical meaning of the word. But there are some pointers which can suggest you in the right way. The first thing is the contractual term must create a significant imbalance in rights and obligations between the parties. So a term which might look unfair when you first read it, if you go through and actually work out how it applies in the circumstances of the contract, you might find that it actually doesn't operate to create a significant imbalance in the rights and obligations of the parties. Okay, so what you have to look at is how is this provision going to actually work when the contract um, is given effect, when the contract is executed. If it doesn't create a significant imbalance in the rights and obligations of the parties, it's not an unfair contractual term. Realistically though, that bit's usually the easy bit to, to work out. The difficulty comes with the second dot point. 
you see a standard form contract is allowed to include a contractual term which creates a significant imbalance in rights and obligations if that contractual term is reasonably necessary to protect the legitimate interests of the party proffering the term. So what that means is that um, depending on the circumstances of a particular type of business they may actually be able to impose what on the what might look like quite unfair contractual terms. The example that I've given in the notes, I think it's a pretty good one, and I don't just think that because I made it up. We've got two retailers who are each selling shirts. Retailer number one is selling shirts that you buy off the rack. Okay, so you get a chance to try the shirt on, you get a chance to have a look at the stitching, admire yourself in the mirror, work out that it all looks great. Retailer number two is selling bespoke shirts. So they're making them up exactly to your measurements. You go in, you choose out the fabric, you choose out the thread, you get measured up by someone who calls you sir a lot, and then you come back two weeks later for a fitting, and then you come back two weeks after that and you've got a shirt. Now, let's look at both of these situations. If we get our shirt home and we decide that we don't like it after all, or we decide that we're unhappy with the workmanship, in the first case, where all they're going to do is stick it back on a coat hanger and sell it to someone else, there's really no loss suffered by the company. So it would be unreasonable for the company to, to uh, have provisions in a standard form contract that really operated to the disadvantage of the customer. In the second case, though, the whole point of the shirt is that it's made specifically to your measurements. And so if you give it back to them, there's nothing they can do with it. They can't go and sell it to someone else as a custom-made shirt because it was custom-made for you. So you can see that it may be reasonably necessary for them to impose much more onerous conditions on the circumstances in which they're prepared to offer a refund for that shirt because their legitimate business interests are entirely different to the legitimate business interests of the off-the-rack seller. Now I've asked you to read a case uh, which looks very carefully at this idea of uh, legitimate interests and that case is uh, the Director of Consumer Affairs and Train Station Health Clubs which talked about when a gym provider might be able to um, basically terminate the contract with a client, kick somebody out of the gym. And it was pretty one-sided. If you're a member of the gym you can't just decide on 14 days notice or 30 days notice that you no longer want to be a member of the gym. If you've signed up for a year, you get to pay for the year. However, the gym, on the other hand, could kick somebody out with 14 to 30 days notice. Now, at first blush, that sounds unfair. But then you look at this actual case and you say, well, hang on, what the rule actually says is that if somebody's behaving antisocially in the gym, or if somebody is refusing to obey the rules of the gym which relate to things like safety in the gym, then the gym may actually have a, a legitimate reason to refuse continued service to that person. Now, then, the gym's not saying that they want to get additional money. They don't want the person to keep paying for the rest of the 12 months. All they want to do is terminate the contract and make the person and the problem go away. So you can't really say that the gym is acting unreasonably. You can identify a legitimate interest that they're trying to protect. It's not an illegitimate interest. It's not like they're turning around and saying, well, we don't like you because you don't work out hard enough and because you're not, not sufficiently hardcore, you have to go and work out somewhere else. If they do have a legitimate interest that's being protected, well, then suddenly the unfair contractual term starts to look a lot less unfair. So again, we're talking about a question of fact. You're going to have to look at each individual uh, case on its own merits in its individual circumstances to work out whether there is a legitimate interest uh, being protected. The third aspect is that the unfair contractual term has to cause a detriment to the consumer. Now, now what that means is that an unfair contractual term can be as unfair as you want if it's in the consumer's favour.
So if a retailer is silly enough to offer somebody a, a standard form contract, which includes unfair contractual terms that are entirely in favour of the, uh, the customer, well then so be it, and they can just wear it. The idea, of course, is that the, uh, the legislation is intending to protect the people who have the, the contract shoved under their nose, rather than the retailer who's actually doing the shoving of the contract under people's nose. So let's say we've looked at those three. We've got a standard form contract. It's definitely a consumer contract. We can identify a significant imbalance in rights and obligations. We can see that there's no real legitimate reason for the uh, imbalance in rights and obligations. And we can definitely identify a detriment to the consumer. What is that going to mean? Most of the time it will mean the contract is void. Okay, most of the time it will mean the contract has no effect. In reality, I think it's probably um, probably fair to argue that the contract is actually avoidable because most of the time the customer is going to be able to happily continue with the transaction so long as there are no disputes. But if we take it as read that there is suddenly a dispute between the customer and the retailer, then um, if the Australian consumer law is called into action, the contract is usually going to be void. Unless, now there are two exceptions. The first one is where the term relates to the main contractual subject matter. Okay, so if you're being if you're being sold um, a, a set of services, then the description of those services will be the main contractual subject matter. And even if the description of those services contains a significant imbalance in rights and obligations, it's going to be permitted. And the reason that it's going to be permitted is this is not something which is tucked away in the boilerplate. This is something which is up front and even in everybody's face and you're really expected to uh, um, take some responsibility as the consumer for at least knowing what, what the fundamental basis is of the contract. The second uh, exception relates to the upfront price. So if there is an upfront price, this is the, the, the price that might have been advertised or might be displayed within the store, um, then the retailer is entitled to be as outrageous as they wish in terms of asking for their price. A re retailer, if they wish to, they can offer to sell you a jelly bean for $1,000. You're not likely to take them up on that deal, but they can ask that if they want. Okay, so um, a few years ago, some of you may remember that uh, that Ansett Airlines ran into a great deal of trouble and eventually folded. Now, this isn't a consumer contract, but it's a great example uh, where something that looks unfair can be offered. When the liquidators took over Ansett for about two weeks, they were hoping that um, that Virgin Australia may buy out all of Ansett's aircraft and facilities. And so they offered Ansett for sale. The entire company was offered for sale for a price of $1. Now nobody took the offer up because by buying the company you would also be buying the massive amounts of debt that the company was in. But you can see that initially it looks a little bit unfair or a little bit one-sided to be selling an airline for a $1. But it's quite okay. You can make whatever, out, even in a, a, an un, a, in a consumer contract, in a standard form contract, you can make whatever outrageous requirements you like in terms of cost because the law requires on the market to give people the opportunity to walk away. Okay, so uh, there's no need for that term to be protected by the Australian consumer law. So that's how it works. Uh, that's how the law works in terms of um, unfair provisions in standard form consumer contracts. Where does this fit in with the rest of our contract law? Well, essentially, it puts limits around um, the freedom of contractual, uh, the, the freedom to contract. And what you might remember is that right back at the start of the semester we talked a little bit about theory and I talked about classical contract theory which basically said people can make whatever contracts they like and I talked about the idea that in fact nowadays the uh, um, the law does set some limits around 
uh, what sorts of contracts will and won't be enforced. And so you can see these rules in that context. It is no longer open to retailers to act in a way which um, is unfair if they're going to be presenting customers with uh, a standard form contract. What it means for you as a lawyer is that the provision is void. Okay, the provision is void and most of the time that's going to mean the entire contract is void. Uh, if it is possible However, if it is possible to sever the void provision, um, then you may well be required to do that. But look, for the purposes of our assignment and exams, I can tell you now, I'm not going to spring that one on you. Let's move along and start talking about consumer guarantees. I think this is the most interesting stuff that we're talking about this week. Because this plugs right into the implied terms we were discussing last week. These consumer guarantees are basically the Australian consumer law saying, right, henceforth, every single consumer contract in Australia, not just standard form contracts, but all consumer contracts in Australia, will come with a bunch of guarantees. And not only are these guarantees in place, but they can't be contracted out of. So a retailer cannot impose a contract on a consumer where the consumer signs away their rights under the Australian Consumer Law. Any attempt to sign away the rights for these consumer guarantees is automatically invalid. Okay, The Australian Consumer Law prevails over that contractual freedom. And there are a bunch of these um, guarantees and they're all pretty good ones. The first one is free title to goods. Now. I'm only going to talk about this a little bit briefly because the concepts of possession and ownership and indeed the concept of title is something that you'll deal with much more uh, when you come to your property law subject. But essentially um, what they're saying is, is an extension of uh, what you will learn is called the Nemo Dat Rule, which says you cannot sell what you do not have. So a person who's selling goods to a consumer must be able to guarantee that the consumer will be getting free title to both possession and ownership of the goods. That means the consumer will be able to take the goods away in their own possession. The consumer will also be able to execute all of the other entitlements that come along with ownership. You see, ownership is like a bundle of rights. How do you know someone owns something? Well, they own it if they have the right to sell it, if they have the right to disassemble it, if they have the right to destroy it, if they have the right to paint it, if they have the right to give it away, if they have a right to leave it in a will, then it's a possession which they own. Now if they can't do all of those things, well then they don't have free title, do they? And so you can hardly sell something to someone and say, I'm going to, I'm going to get you to pay me a price for this if you're not actually able to give them that full bundle of rights. If you're not giving them the full bundle of rights associated with ownership, then you're probably only giving away possession, which is the same as hiring something. So if I hire you my car, I'm giving you possession of my car for an amount of money, but I'm sure not giving you ownership of it. I'm expecting it back and I'm expecting it back in one piece and in the same colour as I uh, as it was when I gave it to you. So you see, what the consumer law says is that for consumer contracts that involve sale of goods, the person selling the goods must be able to guarantee both possession and ownership of the goods. That means if you buy something from the store and you take it home, no one should be able to come back and say, no, hang on, that's my TV and I want it back. The second consumer guarantee I want to talk about is the quality and fitness of goods for any usual or any disclosed purpose. Now, they're quite different. Any usual purpose means any purpose that a normal person might expect to be able to use the product for. So if you buy a picture frame, you expect to be able to hang a picture from it. If you buy a um, compact disc, does anybody buy a compact disc anymore? If you buy a compact disc, you expect to be able to use it to play uh, music or record data. Um, if you buy a skateboard, you expect to be able to ride it. 
couple of years ago there was a Chinese company which was selling cars in Australia and the cars had a roof rack on them and inside this roof rack where you would actually have to be sitting on the roof to see it was a sticker that said roof rack for decorative purposes only and this was only realized when people started attaching things to this roof rack and hitting the brakes hard and having the entire contents of the roof rack sail over the front of the vehicle and land on the road now of course you can see <clears throat> that that roof rack was not fit for the usual purpose of a roof rack second uh, guarantee there is the use for any disclosed purpose now I ran into this one just recently myself I bought a um, heart rate monitor for use during exercise bought it at a, a, one of those sporting goods stores and I said to the dude who uh, sold it to me am I right to wear this if I go for a swim will it record my heart rate while I go for a swim and he looked at it and he said yeah look says right here water resistant to 30 meters so I wore this watch in the surf and uh, straight away it was kaput so I sailed back into the store and um, said hey oh, I want my money back please because um, not even a replacement is going to cut it here because the replacement is going to be kaput the moment I get into the water as well and the guy at the store turned around and said well look no if you if you have a look at the uh, paperwork on this watch it says that water resistant to 30 meters means that it's basically splash resistant it's not going to stop working if it gets in the rain but it doesn't mean you can go and uh, wear it in the in the pool or the surf and I said to him hey have you ever heard of the Australian consumer law and he said oh yes yes but this is not the usual purpose of this watch and so I gave him my best lawyer's smile and said well problem is that I disclosed to you guys that I had the purpose of wearing this watch in the water whilst exercising before I purchased it so guess what mate you owe me a refund now I got the refund in the end but what you can see there is we're talking about a disclosed purpose so someone might be buying something for an unusual purpose as long as they let the retailer know what that unusual purpose is if the retailer reassures them that the product is fine for that purpose well they are completely and utterly entitled then to assume that the product is going to work for that purpose and if it doesn't then they're entitled to go back and get themselves a refund the third thing is that additional warranties which are provided by the seller or by the manufacturer must be honored so in other words if you've got an overseas company which provides a bunch of uh, of guarantees or warranties associated with a product and you then uh, purchase that product in an environment where the Australian consumer law is valid so you're purchasing it say in a store here in Australia you get both you get both the warranty provided by the seller or manufacturer and the benefit of the Australian consumer law so whichever of those is more generous to you whichever of those is, is is basically preferred by you to resolve the dispute you're entitled to rely on and the reason is that those additional warranties then become binding on the company not just because they're warranties but because the Australian consumer law makes them binding on the company as well so there's actually a double whammy of obligation there um, upon the seller or manufacturer now we go on to the consumer guarantees as they apply to services so mainly to this point we've been talking about um, the consumer guarantees applying to goods consumer guarantees applying to services first is that uh, the services have to be given effect with due care and skill now due care and skill is a bit of a uh, it's a bit of a mobile concept really if you're getting your gardens done by a landscape gardener who's adv advertising says that they're a master landscape gardener who's won six different prizes at the Chelsea Flower Show in the United Kingdom uh, then you can expect them to pay a lot of money sorry you can expect to pay them a lot of money but you can expect them to do a rockin job on the other hand if you're getting the job done by your cousin 
because your auntie Flo has asked you to sling him a few dollars to let him mow the lawns, then your expectations have to be a lot lower. So due care and skill is based on um, essentially what has been represented to you and what might be reasonable to expect under the circumstances. Now there are some types of operation where due care and skill has to meet a minimum level. If you're going to let someone work on your car, then really you're going to have to, like if it's being done in a commercial environment, then they're going to have to be able to provide you with a due level of care and skill to ensure that the car is returned to a safe and roadworthy condition. If you take someone, uh, if you take, if you get a service provided by somebody who's saying that they're capable of providing the service, and then it turns out that they lack the ability to complete the service with due care and skill, will you get your money back? And um, we, I mean, we'll talk more about remedies in contracts B, but in this sort of situation, you wouldn't only get your money back, uh, you'd also be able to pay, have them pay for someone to undo whatever damage they had done in the first place. Finally, services have to be rendered within a reasonable time. Now, a reasonable time is going to uh, depend very much on um, what sort of service it is that we're talking about. But if you've paid for a service, let's say you've paid to have something delivered to your home and you're told that it's going to be delivered on Wednesday, uh, by the time you get to the following Wednesday, they're probably out of reasonable time. So services can't be delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. Um, I find it interesting, I've, I've uh, seen some of these programs about people renovating houses in the United Kingdom and builders and so on think nothing of turning up three or four weeks late on site with whatever they've said that they would provide. Well in Australia they would very quickly run foul of the Australian consumer law because if you say that something's going to be uh, on site within a, by a particular time, well then some minor delays might be appropriate, that might be fine depending on the actual terms of the contract, but there's going to be a limit on that. The services have to be rendered within a reasonable time. Now that brings us pretty much to the end of uh, Australian consumer law stuff. I'm very much aware though, I, I guess I, I, I reflect on this every week, but for this week in particular I'm very much aware that we have been skating over this material at a very shallow level. Um, and so let, let me put it to you in a really straight way that if you just rely on this lecture to understand the Australian consumer law, uh, then you're nuts and you'll probably fail this part of the subject. You really do need to go and have a look not only at the lecture notes that I've written up for you on the Australian consumer law, uh, but also at the Treasury documentation which I referred to um, not only this week but also in week one. Having said that, what have we looked at this week? Well, we've talked about the meaning of a consumer contract and the uh, and the criteria differentiating the consumer contract from other business contracts. So that's $40,000 threshold, and it's got to be uh, for the normal sort of household or domestic use. It can't be for resale, and it can't be for transformation or manufacture in trade and commerce. We've talked about what a standard form contract is. The idea that a standard form contract means you're using virtually an identical contract for virtually identical transactions and it's usually given by the retailer on a take it or leave it basis. We've talked about the fact that the Australian consumer law deals with those standard form contracts in a specific way by outlawing or by making void unfair contractual terms. And we talked about what we meant by an unfair term. In particular, we talked about some of the exceptions. Remember that something that looks like an unfair term might not be if it's protecting a legitimate interest of the retailer, or if it relates to the main subject of the contract, or if it relates to the upfront price. Finally, we've talked about the consumer guarantees established by the Australian Consumer Law. We've talked about the fact that they are essentially implied provisions which are implied into all consumer contracts and which are valid regardless of anything that you might say um, elsewhere in the terms of that contract. They apply to contracts both for goods and for services, although they're separate rules for each. Alright, next week we're going to talk about a strange beast called privity 
Um, next week is the week when it is completely cool to be studying this stuff in Queensland because the privity laws in Queensland are so much easier to understand than the privity laws in the common, uh, the common law states such as New South Wales. But let's worry about privity this week. I hope you enjoy the rest of your uh, reading about the, uh, the ACL this week. And uh, hey, guess what? There's only one week of the term left. Have a great week.